if someone asks you what is your best childhood memory, what would be your answer? Mine would be playing in the sand with my sister. Would you believe me if I say this sand not only created memories for me but also plays a major role in the manufacturing of many semiconductor devices? To know the truth, continue watching. Hi, this is Benila. I make videos based on engineering concepts. If you are into this, consider subscribing. In this video, I am going to explain about diode. Let's start with the basic unit, atom. Every atom is composed of a nucleus and one or more electrons bound to the nucleus. This nucleus is made of protons and neutrons. The protons have positive electric charge. The neutrons have no electric charge. That means it is electrically neutral. The electrons revolve around the nucleus in a path called shells. Number of electrons at each shell can be found using 2n square. So the first shell can occupy 2 electrons. The second shell can occupy 8 electrons. And the third shell can occupy 18 electrons and so on. These electrons are negatively charged. An atom will have equal number of protons and electrons. That means equal number of positive charges and negative charges. So in a whole atom is electrically neutral. So let's consider an example boron. It has 5 proton and 5 electron. If a boron atom loses an electron, then it has 4 electron and 5 proton. That means it has more positive charge. So now the boron atom becomes boron positive ion. In the same way, if a boron atom gains an electron, then the boron atom becomes boron negative ion. While learning number of electrons at each shell, an important rule to consider is octet rule. The rule states that the main group elements tend to bond in such a way that each atom has 8 electrons in its valence shell. What does it mean? If we consider the third shell to be the final shell of this atom, then the third shell will tend to occupy only 8 electrons. The electrons in the final shell is called valence electrons and the final shell is called valence shell. Now let's consider an atom whose valence shell has 7 electrons. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. This shell will always ready to accept an electron so that it can satisfy octet rule. So a hole is considered to be present there. A hole is the absence of electron in a particular place in an atom. In the same way, each time an atom loses an electron, a hole is formed in that place. We know that the current is a flow of electrons. So depending on this, the materials are classified as Conductors, insulators, and semiconductors. First, let's see about conductors. The conductors are the material in which electron can flow freely. The insulators are the material in which the electron does not flow freely. The semiconductor are materials whose conductivity is between insulator and conductor. The example for a semiconductor is silicon. Let's see more about this silicon. First, where do we find the silicon? They are found in dust and sand in the form of silicon dioxide. This is why I referred the sand plays a major role in the creation of most semiconductor devices. Okay, now how do we get this silicon from the silicon dioxide? The silicon dioxide is heated up with carbon. At high temperature, Carbon leaves as carbon dioxide, giving us pure silicon. Do you know the color of the pure silicon? It's bluish gray in color. And this is the picture of the silicon. From the atomic table, we can see the atomic number of silicon is 14. Let's see the basic electron configuration of a silicon atom. Since the atomic number is 14, the number of electron will also be 14. In this, we can see the number of valence electron 
of a silicon atom is 4. Generally, only valence electron will participate in the formation of chemical bond. So, to make it simple, we are just considering the valence shell. In a pure silicon material, each silicon atom is surrounded by four other silicon atoms. We know that silicon needs four more electrons in its valence shell to satisfy the octet rule. So, each atom will share electron with its neighboring atom to get the eight valence electron. This type of bonding is called covalent bonding. Look, now this atom has eight valence electron. Not only this atom, each and every atom will share its neighbor to get the valence shell filled. In reality, each silicon atom will be very close to each other. So, the bonding would be something like this. Once the valence shell is filled, the atom will become inactive. So, there will be no flow of electrons. Thus, this acts as an insulator. So, to make this active, silicon is doped with group 3 elements. The group 3 refers to the elements whose valence shell has 3 electrons. Doping means adding an impurity. Let's take an example, aluminium. The atomic number of aluminium is 13. The number of valence electron is 3. To make it simple, we'll just consider only valence electrons. First, let's take a pure silicon. Now, when we replace a silicon atom with aluminium, a hole is introduced in the valence shell. Now, the conductivity will occur due to the hole transfer. Let's see what is meant by this hole transfer. For that, let's consider another atom with a free electron. The electron will happily reach this hole. Since one of its electron is moved from its position, a hole is introduced in that atom. Again, this hole will be filled by another free electron from another atom. This process is called hole transfer. This type of doping where conduction is through hole transfer is called P-type semiconductor. Therefore, majority carriers in this type is holes and a minority carriers is free electrons. Now, do you wonder how free electrons are formed in this case? Well, when a thermal energy or an energy in a form of light is applied to the material, atoms present in the material vibrate and few electron bonds break. So, few free electrons and holes are generated. Those extra holes produced will join the majority carrier list and the free electrons will join the minority carrier list. Now, let's see what happens when a silicon atom is doped with a group 5 element. Group 5 refers to the elements whose valence shell has 5 electrons. Let's take an example, phosphorus. The atomic number is 15. Therefore, the number of electrons will also be 15. To make it simple, we will consider only the valence electron. First, let's take a pure silicon. Now, when we replace one silicon atom with phosphorus, an extra electron is introduced in the valence shell. Now, the conduction takes place due to the free electron movement. This type of impure semiconductor where conduction is through free electron is called n-type semiconductor. Majority carriers in this type is electrons and minority carriers is holes. These minority carriers are generated in the same way as we discussed earlier. Now, let's summarize the P-type and N-type semiconductor. First, the P-type. Its majority carriers are holes and the minority carriers are electrons. Now, the N-type. Its majority carriers are electrons and its minority carriers are holes. Both the electron in P-type and N-type are same. Just to show the difference of majority and minority carriers, I have used the difference notation. One as small e and the other one as red dot. Same applies to the holes. Now, let's see about diode. A diode is formed by joining two equally doped P-type and N-type semiconductor. Since holes and electrons are close to each other at junction, 
some electron crosses the junction to fill the adjacent holes in the p type when an electron leaves an atom the number of protons in the atom increases and it makes an atom positive ion in the same way when an electron reaches the hole the number of electrons in the atom increases and makes the atom negative ion also free electrons from p type are attracted across the junction to fill the holes in the n type the n type and p type material are both electrically neutral before the charge carriers diffuse across the junction but after diffusion the portion of p type closest to the junction occurs negative charge and the n type occurs positive charge the negative charge in a p type tends to repel additional electrons crossing from the n side since there is a positive charge in one side and negative charge in another side a potential difference or in other words voltage is generated this is called barrier voltage or barrier potential typical barrier voltage for silicon is 0.7 volt that means to migrate the electron from n type material to p type material we need we need to apply voltage greater than 0.7 volt the movement of charge carriers across the junction leaves a layer on each side without any charge carriers that means this region has no electrons and no holes only charged ions are present this region is called depletion region during forward bias condition a battery is connected with its positive end to p type and its negative end to n type look carefully the negative terminal is connected to the n type material that means it is connected to the material which has more free electrons electrons are negatively charged so they are repelled from the negative end of the battery but we know that there is a barrier voltage in the junction that voltage will not allow the repelled electron to enter the p type but if our battery voltage is greater than the barrier voltage the electron will pass through the junction and reach the holes in the p type then the electrons are attracted to the positive terminal of the battery and they again reach the n type material this process repeats continuously until the diode is connected in forward bias condition it is clear that during forward bias the flow of electron occurs therefore we can conclude that diode allows current to flow through it during forward bias condition during the reverse bias the negative terminal of the battery is connected to the p type material and the positive terminal is connected to the n type material now the electrons are attracted towards the positive terminal and the holes are attracted towards the negative terminal therefore the barrier voltage is increased and the diode acts as an open circuit therefore we can conclude that the diode does not allow current to flow through it during the reverse bias condition so in conclusion during forward bias diode allows the flow of current and during reverse bias Di diode does not allows the flow of current in my next video we are going to see how this diodes are used in uncontrolled rectifier so if you are interested don't forget to subscribe and click the bell icon so that you will be notified each time i upload a video